Amen. Well, thank you, Whitney. Good morning, City Light. It is a good day to dig into God's Word together. Would you agree? Uh, we are going through this spring the book of First John. First John was written by the man that the book is named after. His name's John. Um, he wrote five books of the Bible. One is a gospel, an account of Jesus' life. John was a follower of Jesus, walked with him on this earth, and he wrote um, Jesus' story. It's the gospel according to John. John also wrote three letters, 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John. Um, as a pastor, he shepherded the church at Ephesus, the same church that the Apostle Paul wrote the book of Ephesians to. And uh, John wrote three letters, 1st, 2nd, 3rd John, as a pastor to shepherd and encourage them. And then John wrote the book of Revelation, uh, an account of what is to come. That Jesus is both the king who reigns now and will reign forever. And so John wrote wrote five books of the Bible, one commentator gave kind of a helpful overview of the purpose of each of these books. At least I found it helpful. So let me share it with you. John's gospel, he said, was meant to convert sinners. John's revelation is meant to crown the Savior. And John's letters are meant to confirm the saints. In other words, John's gospel is written so that people who don't know Jesus would find him and put their faith in him so that they can have eternal life. Revelation is meant to show that Jesus is the king now and forever. He's worthy of giving your life to and getting his eternal life. And these three letters, 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John, are written pastorally. To the people who've already put their faith in Jesus, they're inside the church, and yet they're just encountering the challenges of life. Anybody else grateful that the Bible doesn't pretend life is easy? Right? Like it just reckons with reality. It knows there are challenges in life. And John, in these three letters, is writing to his church addressing the challenges of the day. This church had all kinds of challenges. Um, people outside the church were telling the people inside the church that what they believe about Jesus is wrong. And the people inside the church were divided about all kinds of things. If we look at Paul's letter to the Ephesian church, it said they were divided on issues of theology, marriage and gender roles, parenting styles, and master-slave relations. All right? Times were tough. They were challenging. They were dealing with some things. And John saw all that was happening. And he wrote this letter to encourage them. Now, I think it's a good time for us to hear what John has to say. Any of you with me? Like, I, I know the circumstances, the details of our situations are different. But it feels like the issues are broadly the same. For example, uh, Gallup came out with a survey recently that said that church membership in America um, stands at 47%. In other words, 47% of Americans are members of a church, a synagogue, or a mosque. That's down from 50% in 2018, just a few years ago, and down from 70% back in 1999. That is a sharp decline. What it indicates is that for the first time in our lifetimes, there are more people who do, in the world around us who do not associate with a church than people who do. And I think that kind of trend is creating a world where in ever-increasing ways we're facing the same challenges that the church in John's day faced. And so what a grace to have John's letter to the church. Are you with me? I mean, how cool is it that we get to hear from Pastor John, a man who walked with Jesus, who heard him speak, who saw him work miracles, who got the revelation of all that Jesus would do between now and the ushering in of his kingdom. John spoke and encouraged his church, and we get to listen in. We get to read and hear and soak in the encouragement he gave to them, and we get to make it ours today. That's what's going on in 1 John. And so today, we get to look at the middle of chapter 2, 
But I thought it might be helpful to do a little catch up first on how we get to the middle of chapter two. We had Easter, which was awesome, and then Elvin was here last week. I thought maybe let's just bring it all together, all right? So we'll do a little bit of uh, structure, John's line of thinking, and then we'll dig into the uh, text for today. In chapters one and two, John gives us his message, its meaning, and its mandates. That's good pastoral alliteration there, all right? Three M's, a message, meaning, mandates. Here's how John describes the message. He says, this is the message we have heard from him, that's Jesus, and proclaim to you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. And so John is saying, hey, Jesus gave us, the apostles, a message to proclaim, and now we're passing it on to you. It's this, God is light, and there is no darkness in his light. And, you know, as far as good Christian language goes, we think that's awesome, right? That sounds good. I like that. God's light. pushing back the darkness. But you may think it is a little abstract, John. Like, what do you mean by light and darkness? darkness. Well, he tells us what he means. He gives us the meaning of the message. He starts it like this. But if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, as God is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. So he tells us what life in the light means. Number one, Those who walk in the light have been cleansed from their sin by the blood of Jesus. Somebody say amen. All right? Life in the light means we've been cleansed from our sin by the blood of Jesus. Life in the light is life free from sin. It means Jesus' sacrificial death on the cross, his shed blood is like oxyclean for the soul. All the stains of sin that cling and hold tight, he washes away. Number one, life in the light is life free from sin. Number two, we see that those who walk in the light have fellowship with one another. Fellowship is a Bible word for friendship, for community. It means we're friends. We get along with one another. We support each other and depend on each other. John's telling us that life in the light of Jesus isn't me and Jesus one-on-one, that God is creating a community of light. We do this together. And so the message is God is light, And that means God has no sin. He's cleansing us from our sin to create a community of light. And out of that message and meaning, we find two mandates. Uh, I use mandates just because of the alliteration, okay? They're implications. If that's true about God, it has real implications for us right here, right now. They are love your brother and do not love the world. Love your brother and do not love the world. The world. And friends, I want to say from the outset, those are countercultural mandates. Because what John is saying is not, hey, follow your heart. John is saying, direct your heart. This is what you should love. You love your brother, and you should not let your heart fall in love with the world and the things of the world. He's saying because God is light and he's cleansing us from our sin, we direct our heart towards some things and we keep our heart from being directed toward other things. Are you with me? Let me show it to you in God's word. All right. He, uh, number one, love your brother. John says, whoever says he is in the light and hates his brother is still in darkness. Whoever loves his brother abides in the light. And so he's just making it clear, to walk in God's community of light, you got to love your brother. You cannot hate the people that God loves and walk in the light. It does not work that way. You, to walk in the light, you love your brother. Now, John uses that word brother to describe what happens when we put our faith in Jesus and become part of the family of God. He's saying that when you put your faith in Jesus, you become a child of God. In other words, God in heaven becomes your father and everyone else who puts their faith in Jesus shares God the father 
which makes us brothers and sisters in Christ. You tracking with me? This is pretty basic teaching in the church, goes way back, but John is using this, and he is saying that when we walk in the light, we love one another as a family because we are all loved by the same Father. If he can love that person who sings off key behind you, you can love him too, okay? That's what John's saying here. To walk in the light, you love your brother. He is not saying that we all have to agree on every aspect of every area of life. He's just saying we can't let our differences diminish our love for one another, right? Can't let our differences diminish our love for one another. So, John says, love your brother. Now that's all recap. That's just the line of thought that John's got going that brings us to our passage today. Uh, I, I hear John say this, love your brother, and if I'm honest, I think, man, I don't know, this last year has made that kind of hard. I don't know about you guys, but I think like uh, politics and protests and pandemics, they have all made it easier to hate than to love. Online interactions have made it easier to want to win the debate than to listen and love. Lockdowns and quarantines have led to isolation, time alone, that makes it hard to feel like we are brothers and sisters and part of the same family. Still, John says, love your brother. And I hear that and I think, where do you find the strength to do that? How do we live a life walking in the light when there's so much around us that challenges that, that makes it hard to do that? Well, I think John begins to answer that question, where we find the strength to live in the light, with a poem, okay? That's what uh, Whitney read in the first half of our passage today. It's a poem. Um, if you're reading through 1 John, it kind of stands out. Like, there's a bunch of indentations because um, it's Greek poetry instead of like a line left on your page. And so you're like, John, this isn't the Psalms. Why get poetic, right? What's that there for? I think it's there to help us learn and remember. Sort of like anybody learn the poem to remember how many days are in each month? Like 30 days, has September, April, June, and November. You got it. How do we remember that? It's a poem. It makes that fact easier to learn and remember. And I think John's doing that for us here in this poem. He gives us three truths that he wants us to learn and remember, that's where we're going to spend the bulk of our time this morning. So enough catch up. Let's dive in. Here's the three truths in John's poem. You are forgiven. You know who forgives you. And you have overcome the evil one. You're forgiven. You know who forgives you. And you have overcome the evil one. Let's jump in. John begins his poem like this. I am writing to you, little children... Because your sins are forgiven for his name's sake. First truth to know and remember, you can walk in the light because your sins are forgiven. This is the foundation of our relationship with God, all right? If you do not know that God forgives sin, you do not know the God of the Bible. Track with me. This is central to who God is, and I want you to hear this today. The church is not a place for people to come in so that they can hide their sin and do their best to look good on the outside. Those people are fakers, and Jesus doesn't want fakers. He wants forgiveness, all right? So if you've ever felt like that's what you're supposed to do here, Doug and I aren't asking you to do that because Jesus hasn't asked you to do that. The church is not a place where people come in and hide their sin. The church is a place where people come in and find forgiveness for their sin. That's what Jesus wants. And John drives this point home over and over and over again in his letter. Jesus forgives. Let me show it to you. We'll just track through some verses. First, the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from what? All sin, all of it. Next, he is faithful and just to what? Forgive us our sins. He forgives. We go on. 
Jesus is the propitiation. That's the putting down, the stamping out, the paying the price for our sins. He forgives. We go on. You know that he appeared in order to what? Take away sins. Forgiven, separated, washed, cleansed. One more. In this is love. Not that we have loved God, but that he loved us. And what did that love look like? He sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Friends, Jesus forgives. You may have heard that Jesus is a king who reigns. And that is true. You may have heard that Jesus is a savior who died. And that is true. But friends, if you don't know that he is a king who reigns with goodness, who forgives his people and draws them close, you don't know what kind of king he is. And if you don't know that he was a savior who died to take on your sins so that you don't have to bear them anymore, you don't know what kind of savior he is. Jesus forgives. And friends, I want you to hear this today. It matters. I got a weight on me to drive this home because I've had so many conversations lately with people who carry the burden of their sin like a weight around their neck. You ever know what that's like? You ever have that conversation in your head or you have that conversation with people who you love? You just carry the weight of sin. The thoughts might sound something like, I know what the Bible says. I know that Jesus can forgive and does forgive. I just don't know if he's forgiven me. Man, if you knew what I did, you would wonder about it too. It's so dark. I, just, I can't even speak of it. I don't know if I deserve to be forgiven. Maybe if that's you, you've got a theology, a category for forgiveness. You just don't think you fit in that box. Maybe for you it feels different. You believe that Jesus forgives you of your sin, but there's an accuser who just keeps reminding you of your sin over and over again. And it plays so loudly and so often in your mind that it seems to drown out the truth that Jesus has forgiven you. He has the power and he has done it. But it's drowned out by just your sin on replay. The enemy saying, but remember what you did? You remember how dirty that was? Could God ever love you? Could you ever really get rid of that? Could anybody else accept you if they knew about it? The accusations just ring so loud. Friend, if you can relate to any of that, know that you're relating to the people way back in John's day who he wrote this letter to. The schemes of the enemy have not changed. And so you need to hear the same truth, the same encouragement that John gave them. You are forgiven. When you put your faith in Jesus, you are forgiven. Notice what he did not say. You might be forgiven. Like, like maybe that will happen. We don't really know. It's an uncertainty. John didn't say that. John didn't say you could be forgiven. If you just work it out right, if you clean up your act, if you follow Jesus close enough, then you'll be forgiven. He didn't say that. Actually, the Bible says while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. It was while we were far away, he made it happen. The Bible doesn't even say you will be forgiven. Like someday, way out in eternity, if all goes well and when all the things line up, then you can maybe feel some freedom from the burden of sin. What did John say? Your sins are forgiven. Are forgiven. It's done. It's happened. Jesus said it is Finished, signed, sealed, delivered. Your sin that clings so close is cleansed by the blood of the Lamb. If you know it, say amen. amen. 
Jesus forgives his people. And friends, let me take you just a little bit deeper. He says he's forgiven you for his name's sake. There is a purpose for the forgiveness of your sins. He, it means your sins are not forgiven because you tried your best or because you only did little ones that are easy to forgive or because you've carried your guilt long enough or because you've punished yourself hard enough for what you did. No, your sins are forgiven for the sake of Jesus' name, for his glory in all the world. That means that your sins are forgiven so that you can know him. So because he knows you, and you can know his love, and you are free to love him in return. Jesus forgives your sin so that you will celebrate him as your savior and trust him as your king. It means Jesus forgives your sin not because of your worthiness, but so that you will know that he is worthy of all of your devotion. Jesus forgives your sin so that his power to save will be on display in you for all the world to see. Jesus forgives your sin so that you can walk in his community of light and know his love and love one another. Jesus forgives your sin for his name's sake. Amen? And so number one, we have the power, the strength to walk in the light because Jesus forgives us. That's good news. All right, number two, where do we find this strength to walk in the light? We know we're forgiven, and we know the one who forgives us. All right, this is how John says it. I am writing to you, fathers, because you know him who is from the beginning. All right, who is him who is from the beginning? Uh, we could speculate, but John tells us. He actually opens this letter um, with that same phrase. He says, that which was from the beginning, and the Greek there, that which was, could be translated who was. So who was from the beginning? We're looking at the same person. Uh, who was from the beginning? Who we have heard, who we have seen with our eyes, who we've looked upon and have touched with our hands. So him who is from the beginning is the one that John heard and saw and touched Pretty clear this is Jesus, okay? We could have just said it, but I want to show it to you. That's what the Bible tells us. He's talking about Jesus. So John is saying we find strength because we know the same Jesus John knew. Can you imagine knowing Jesus? Can you imagine that? I'm a 49ers fan, all right? Any 49er faithful in here? A few. We got a few. Okay, here's the deal. I was in the Denver airport one time walking down the hall, looking for my gate, and I see in the corner this man dressed in all black, kind of Johnny Cash style, and he's on his phone, and he looks over, and no joke, it was Joe Montana live and in the flesh. And I just lost control. I got starstruck, and I started bouncing off the walls. I was with a couple other guys, and I was like, guys, it's Joe Montana right there. Did you see him? And they were like, no, it's not Joe Montana. And I said, I am right, okay? Believe me. So I pull it up on Google, his picture, and I show it to him. I'm like, we're walking back down that hall, and you're going to see him too. And so we turn back around and walk down that hall. Sure enough, they said, that's Joe Montana. There is no doubt. And so I'm, I lost all concern about finding my gate or catching my flight. He is there. He's the reason I'm a 49ers fan. He won four Super Bowls, all right? He's the guy that got me excited about football. I longed to catch a pass from that man. I had watched him on TV. I had heard commentators talk about how incredible he was. And on that day, I was standing looking at him live and in the flesh, and I could barely handle it. And my friends said, Eric, go up and introduce yourself. Like, talk to him. And you know what I did? I said, ah, he's on the phone. I don't want to make a scene. Kind of intimidated. Nah, that's okay. And we walked down the hall. How's that for an anticlimactic preacher illustration? <laughs> right? <laughs> My childhood hero is there live and in the flesh, and I walked away. Here's the point I want to make. I will forever know about Joe Montana without ever actually knowing him. Forever know about him without ever actually knowing him. And friends, I want to tell you today, that is not what Jesus wants for you. He does not want you to know about him without knowing him. 
And so maybe you've sat in chairs like this and heard commentators like me talking about how amazing he is, and you know about it. Maybe you've seen him at work in the lives of those you love in the world around you, and you know about him. Maybe you've stood at a distance and admired who he is and what he did, but you have never actually known him. Friend, can I tell you this morning, Jesus wants more for you? He forgives our sins so that we can know him. He does not avoid you. He does not hold your sin against you so that he can keep you at a distance. Jesus forgives us so that we can enter into his light and know him. You know the one who forgives you. John says that knowing him is fellowship with him. It's that word for friendship and community. This is how John describes what he's trying to get across in this letter. He says, that which we have seen and heard, that's Jesus, we proclaim also to you why. Why is John encouraging them this way? So that you too may have fellowship with us, and indeed our fellowship was with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. And so Jesus walked this earth and died on the cross to forgive people of their sins, and as he did that, he brought along followers who he told exactly what was happening, and they listened, and they learned, and they trusted in him. And when Jesus died, he went to the grave, and he rose again, and then he appeared to all of those people, more than 500, and said, see I told you this was going to happen. And then all of those people had this message, this deposit from Jesus that they were entrusted to proclaim to others so that their fellowship with Jesus would become our fellowship with Jesus. So that the Jesus they knew becomes the Jesus we know. Friends, we find the strength to walk in the light and love one another because God has loved us and forgiven us and invited us to know him. Number two, we're forgiven, we know the one who forgives us. And then number three, our poem ends like this. John writes, I write to you, young men, because you are strong and the word of God abides in you and you have overcome the evil one. I just love how John pieces this together. He says, you have overcome the evil one. How did that happen? What got them there? First, he says, you are strong. Tells his church, you are strong. It's like the forgiveness that Jesus gave took that weight of sin that hung around our necks and burdened our backs that we just carried and we got weaker and weaker and exhausted by it. The forgiveness just breaks those chains, lifts that weight, and we're able to stand up strong against our accusers. You're strong. And so when the accusations of sin come and try to burden you down again weigh you down we get to say no that's not true that price has been paid that sentence has been served that stain has been washed away Jesus forgives and his forgiveness makes us strong against the enemy and he goes on and he says the word of God abides in you that means that when you're tempted to love the world more than we love God and each other, we're equipped for battle by God's word. So we're strong in his forgiveness, and the word of God abides in us like a tool to fight against the darkness of the world. He's given it to us, imparted it to us, filled us with it. It's the exact thing that Jesus showed us, modeled for us, put on display when he was tempted in the wilderness. So Jesus, just as he's beginning his public ministry, he's like going to go live as God's promised Savior. As he starts, the Holy Spirit leads him out into the wilderness, and he fasts for 40 days. And at the end of 40 days, the enemy comes to tempt him, and the first temptation is with bread. You imagine a 40-day fast followed by the offer of bread? Like, I I can't do it. I get hungry after four hours, right? 40 days. I'm doing Whole30 right now. Anybody know what Whole30 is? 
It's like this thing is supposed to sort of reset your palate so that you don't crave uh, added sugar. You just crave natural sugars. I don't know if it works. I'm just trying it, okay? And uh, so for me, what that means is you basically commit 30 days. You're only going to eat fresh fruits, veggies, and meat. No added sugars, no processed stuff, no bread. And so I started last Sunday, and you know what's happened since? Like Tuesday, another pastor took me to Longhorn Steakhouse, where they bring out that little sweet bread roll, and you cut into it, and the steam comes out, and they spread sweet butter on it. And you know what I did? I watched him eat it while I ate, I ate a salad, okay? And then later that week, on Wednesday, for my city group, the guys, for the first time ever, they decide to get together, and they bring pizza and breadsticks and buffalo wings. <laughs> and you know what I did? I watched him eat it while I ate a side of carrots and celery. Have you ever eaten raw celery? It's awful, and I ate it. And then my 12-year-old son had a birthday, and at his birthday, he ate all the things that 12-year-old boys like, walking tacos with the nacho cheese Doritos and Chex Mix in the little bag, that salty goodness. And they had like Slim Jim beef sticks. All the stuff I shouldn't eat, my wife doesn't allow in the house, is in the house, and I had to watch him eat it. And then just this last weekend, I was at a wedding rehearsal dinner and they had pretzel bites with beer cheese dip and I was salivating while I ate lettuce, rabbit food. I'm telling you, I am weak. I've wanted to quit every day. Jesus fasted for 40 days and I don't know how he made it through. But here's what I know. After 40 days, the devil came up and tempted him and said, I know that the Spirit led you out here. And I know that the Father is preparing you for what he's about to do in the world. I know what you're doing, and you can end it all by turning those stones to bread. And after a 40-day fast, where I know I would have been weak, where did Jesus find his strength? He quoted Scripture. He said, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. It was the word of God abiding in him that gave him strength against the attack of the enemy. It was in him. Twice more, Satan tempted Jesus, and twice more, he found his strength in Scripture. Friends, that's what happens when we walk in the light. The word of God abides in us because the living word of God, Jesus Christ, abides in us. And so, friend, I just want to ask you today, if you hear that and you feel like, I mean, the word of God just, it doesn't feel like it's abiding in me. I don't feel like it's in me like that. Then can I encourage you today, let's take steps in that direction. Let's just get started. It's not rocket science, all right? Listen, we've got like five weeks left in our study of 1 John. And there are five chapters in the book of 1 John. And so, if you commit... Every Sunday afternoon, I'm going to read one chapter of this book. And then after you read that, uh, you just write down whichever verse stood out to you or encouraged you the most or challenged you the most or gave you the deepest thought-provoking question. Just from one chapter, pick one verse and then write that down somewhere. Or put it as the background on your phone. And for the rest of the week, memorize that one verse. By the time summer comes, you'll have memorized five key verses from 1 John, and you will be well on your way to the Word of God abiding in you. A great first step. John ends his poem by saying, you have overcome the evil one. And it happened because they knew they were forgiven. Give them freedom to be strong. And the Word of God was abiding in God's people. That's how they push back the darkness and walk in the light. And so, uh, we've, gone a, we've gone a lot of, uh, covered a lot of ground here, but he gave us two mandates, love your brother and do not love the world. We spent most of our time on love your brother. I want to close by just touching on do not love the world, okay? John says this, do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. It's very clear. Eric paraphrase of this, for the love of God, don't love the world, okay? 
Don't fall in love with the world. He's not talking about the mountains or the oceans or cornfields or even the bluffs, which are easy to fall in love with around here, right? He's not talking about the world like that. He's talking about the things in the world that tempt us to choose life in the darkness of sin rather than life in the light of God. He says all of those things, all the things of the world are passing away. They're fading out and flaming out. And that's the reason why we should not love them. He doesn't want us to love the things that will fail us. So what does he mean? He says that loving the world is the desires of the flesh. That's like our appetites. It's like food and drink and sex and pleasure and rest. The desires of the flesh, our appetites, that's of the world. It's the desire of the eyes. That's like our longings, uh, our ambitions. It's like those new shoes or that new phone, that new truck or that new house or that new PlayStation or whatever it is, that new thing that you long for and see with your eyes and want in your heart. He says it's the pride of life. That's your ego. It's what you long for deep in your heart. It's power. It's position. It's influence. It's reputation. John says the problem problem with all of those things is that none of them last. Food spoils and romance fades. Your house and your shoes will go out of style and there will be a new model of truck and phone coming out soon. There is always another rung on whatever ladder you are trying to climb. And I don't say all that to be depressing. I just want to be real like John was real. It's fading away. He says, and the world is passing away along with its desires, but whoever does the will of God abides forever. That's good news, friends. The world is passing away. So don't love it. Don't hit your wagon to it. This is not uh, John doing religious mandated self-denial or do-goodisms for no reason. John wants us to get to enjoy and know life in the community of light forever. And so we do not love the world that's passing away. We love the things that last. Can I give you three things from this text that show that, uh, that last? One is God. John says he is from the beginning, and the Bible says he has no end. He lasts. The other is his word. The Bible says heaven and earth will pass away, but my word will never pass away. And number three, it's the people in this room. They're eternal. The Bible says whoever does the will of God will abide, how long? Forever. And so, friends, John is saying, do not love the world because it is fading and it is passing away. Set your heart on things that will never fail you. God, his word, and his community of life. Amen? Can we pray together and ask God to direct our hearts like that? Great and awesome God, I thank you for your forgiveness. It's undeserved. We couldn't do it on our own. We were rebels. You were faithful. Yet you looked on us, the Bible says, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. While we were lost, we were dead in our sins, and you made us alive. Jesus, that is incredible grace. And I I just know I need a message like this. I need a passage like this from Pastor John, who looks at the church and all the challenges of a, a world saying, that's not true that's wrong, you're crazy, that's not what happened, of a, of a world where, man, there's just more reasons to be divided than united. God, I need a message that reminds us that we are forgiven because we are loved by the Father who has loved the others that he's forgiven and made us a family. And so it's your love that empowers us to love each other. God, would you work that in us? Even now, would you show us, man, where does my heart have the seeds of love sprouting? I see somebody in need. I see somebody who needs encouragement, who needs support, who's, who, who just needs a friend, a listening ear. Are those seeds where you're showing it to us? God, would you let your light break through? That our church would continue to be a church marked by your love. 
as we love one another. God, would this be a place that is your light on display for a watching world? God, you have given such grace. Would you continue? Would it abound in us for your glory, the good of Council Bluffs? We pray in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. that created the heavens find me now where the grace runs as deep as your scars you pulled me from the clay set me on a rock and called me by your name made my heart whole 